so I had this whole other video that I thought I was gonna put up today and I started working on it yesterday and I actually bailed on it. Like seriously, I, I, I shot it four times. One of those times the microphone was not on and then I even got so far as editing it together and I just wasn't happy with it. So I deleted everything, for real. Here it is, right here. This is the, this was all the edits I already did, but I don't like it. Gone, I'm deleting it. The good news is, between last night and today, some things have come to light, I've had a few ideas. It's actually gonna be an even better video, so I'm glad I did that. But, I did tell myself I was gonna publish a video today. And, as ridiculous as it might seem, it's important for me to follow through on that only because I've been struggling with following through on that. So because that's something I'm having a hard time with, I just need to make this video and put it up today, even though it's not the video I intended. And this kind of got me thinking about a couple of things. This idea of the resistance that Stephen Pressfield talks about in The War of Art and Do the Work and whatnot, that resistance, like what is it? For me, it manifests in, in this gap between what I say I'm gonna do and what I actually do. So if if the things you say you're gonna do, or if you don't even tell yourself you're gonna do anything, like if I just woke up and I had no ambitions for what I would do with that day or that week, I guess it wouldn't bother me that much if I didn't follow through on them. But let's say that I have the ambition of practicing for X amount of time and X amount of days in the week. If I do those things, I'll feel really good because I said, hey, I'm gonna do those things and I did them. But if I don't, I'll feel that burning sensation, that sort of self-loathing thing, because I didn't follow through on them. And if you envision yourself as a person who follows through on the things they say they're going to do, then it's that congruence or incongruence, you know, that self-accountability even, that creates this this bad feeling. And that's kind of the thing I've been struggling with, and it, and it has different names, and it's easy to say like, oh, it's just not ready yet, it's not perfect, blah, 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 blah. But really, if I identify as being a person who does X, and then I don't embody the behaviors that that X person would do, then I feel not so good. Does that make sense? Like I mentioned last week, I'm excited about some of the video projects that I'm working on. I've got more from the, the touring with Larry Carlton. I've got the Snarky Puppy recording, my visit to the Selmer factory. Uh, what else? I'm ex excited about this other one that I was working on that I thought I was gonna have ready today because now I'm excited because I, I it's gonna be better. I don't wanna tell you why yet, but it'll probably be the next video unless the next one's a Larry Carlton thing, but it's gonna be better. With that, since there's so many questions that have been coming in and I haven't done one of these in a while, I thought I would just kind of rapid fire go through some questions. By the way, if you're on the voting, mem if you're a voting member of the Recording Academy, Quartet is up for Grammy consideration for best jazz album. And I think there's two solos, Down, Down South and Hush, it's up for best solos in that. So uh, it is that season, I gotta do my voting, and um, yeah, if anybody seeing this is on that committee, I'd certainly appreciate the... Uh... Okay, without further ado, a couple of your questions. Is transcribing the wrong way to go about learning vocabulary? I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong way. I think transcribing is a great way to learn a lot of things, but vocabulary, I mean, it's you pick it up from all sorts of places. It certainly doesn't have to just come from transcribing. Uh, but then again, I've certainly discovered plenty of things in the process of transcribing that uh, have made their way into my vocabulary. In one video, you mentioned learning the changes to a song, and I wondered what that means to a single note instrument like saxophone. Are you learning the chord symbols written on the paper, or are you learning it as Roman numerals so you can transpose as needed? Chord symbols to me, as a single note player, means, yeah, learn, like I, if, you, if you say a chord to me, I, I wanna quickly know what notes are in that chord. And as a secondary thing, as a, yeah, it's definitely secondary for me, like what might be the scale that goes with that. So if you say C major seven sharp 11, I wanna be aware that that's a C Lydian scale and what notes are in a C Lydian scale. But the first thing I wanna know is like, what's the bottom part of that chord and what's the top? So C major on the bottom, C, E, G, and B natural, and then the extensions on the top, the sharp 11 would indicate F sharp, the 11th, but below that means there's probably a natural nine. So you're stacking that chord up in thirds, C, E, G, B, D, F sharp, and then probably A, the 13th. So you have like a D major triad on top of a C major triad. Uh, notification. Chord by chord and then chords in a progression, I wanna be able to articulate those chords vertically as a single line player. Does that make sense? Do you use half tongue to play ghost notes? Yeah, I think I use those terms interchangeably, interchangeably, and that for me means kind of 
your tongue is on the reed while you're articulating, hence the half tongue. So it's a way of, out, of articulating without certainly being staccato and without like a full articulation. So it's a legato way of articulating. You know, Dexter Gordon did this a lot. I mean, so many players do this, it'd be kind of hard to come up with a, a comprehensive list, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a very common way of, of uh, artic jazz articulation on the saxophone. What is the microphone you are using, not during the vlog parts, but when you record your sax? Um, it's an LCT540 made by Lewitt, L-E-W. I-T-T is the name of the company, Lewitt Audio, LCT 540. How do you practice when you're on tour or do you practice when you're on tour? So, you know, I think I'll get to this a little bit in these Larry Carlton tour vlogs that I'm trying to make, but uh, I've, you know, in some of the past tour vlogs, if you go back and check those out, you'll see what I do do. But most of the time it's not, it's not, the, it's not anywhere near the same type of practice I would do at home. It's just kind of warm-ups and that depends on the amount of time I have in that day, how much you're traveling, um, you know, it, yeah, it really depends on time. Most often for me, there's not the time to practice and I'm in hotel rooms and places where I don't feel comfortable playing at full volume in a hotel. So even with stuffing a towel in the bell, like you can see in the, the previous video um, before this, that I do that a little bit. But uh, it's just, a, it's trying to get limber. The practice for me is the playing on stage that night. That's the that's it, that's the in, in substitute of like practicing in a practice room. Hi Bob, I don't know anyone who has such a wonderfully organized and methodical approach to practicing. The calendars on your wall are also pretty neatly organized. Would love to know how you plan. I did a vlog on that. It's like three vlogs ago. Um, I'll try to link to it. This one was on uh, the music video for the song Sway. It's probably a long shot to ask, but would you be willing to provide even just the first couple of chords to get me started picking out the rest? You bet. All right, I think I'll end it with this one. This uh, two videos ago, the one I, I made called Perfect is the Enemy of Good. Uh, Ramsey said, perfect is the enemy of good, but also remember resistance, the thing you, okay. Unfortunately, we, we all want you to make more videos than there's time for, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who would ask you to get an editor for your vlogs so that you could ship more, you could make more. I get this a lot. Hey, why, you know, you're short on time and video, making these videos takes a lot of effort. Why not hire an editor? The reason, it's a good point, but the reason is that making these videos is a very personal and creative act for me, and at, at least at this moment, um, the editing is, is, a big, is the biggest part of that, of putting something together that feels like the story I wanna share, whatever that may be. Uh, I'm, I'm a terrible delegator for anything in the first place, um, to a fault, but at the moment, it would be hard for me to outsource the editing. Even you know, let's even even if somebody was doing it for free or low cost, like let's say I know how many hours it takes, so I know how labor intensive that is. So it'd probably be pretty expensive to get somebody to edit the videos. But even if I could afford that, I'm not sure that I would want to do that because that is that's the thing. Like it's hard to do, and there is a lot of resistance to doing it for me. But I feel really good once I've done it. Like I'm gonna try to get this done today so that I can close up shop and feel good about the fact that I made this video because I said I was gonna make this video and I actually did it. And you know, if I just, if I sent it to an editor and like had to wait for them to get back to me and then I had to review it, I don't know, it just would sort of be a different thing. So that's where I am with it now could change in the future. All right, so stay tuned. I'm very excited about this next video or two that I'm making, um, but I just wanted to get this up today. I hope that was somewhat enjoyable and that uh, those questions were maybe some that you had on your mind. You wanna see? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that looks so funny. See? Yeah. <laughs> hey. Careful, honey. You got paint in my hair. Well, yeah, I mean, what would you expect?